what do you say the origin of Judaism was? <laughs> White supremacy. White supremacy. Here, here, here. We're just vibes and just vibes. Just starting this out right here. It's something I was going to record after the Rasta Roundtable. Heal up to the Honorable Priest Isaac and the Rasta Fry Roundtable. Heal up to um, Ras Icoma. You know, heal up to, you know, Ras Safer Selassie. Also, you know, you know, and I, brother, I CERN, you know what I mean? With his particular perspective. Also, Ras, um, the other Ras, uh, Kwame, I think he was on the line earlier on, but I don't know if, you know, his, he, he, you know he didn't really give a, a sort of comment. But this is a question, and give thanks, um, you know, I CERN, I did see that you made a couple of comments on the Rastafari Jews. Hopefully this will go up on the Rastafari Jews. We're going to try to hit this up there hot even, you know, by the new light and everything. So hopefully you all see this right here. This is the answer. What is the origin of Judaism? Our brother Ras Sefer Selassie basically said it plainly. He said white supremacy. I will say, just to agree with what he say, but just to give a little bit of clarity, you know, um white pseudo supremacy because actually it's inferiority right that's like really inferiority posing as supremacy because if you're supreme you know what i mean you don't have to do what them did and do you know what i mean to so-called maintain you know what i mean supremacy you know what i mean supreme is supreme you know what i'm saying you know if you're supreme you're supreme right but judaism i was asked this question what's the origin of judaism well, actually we were asked this question you know, since we, Brother Ross, Sefer Selassie, and I, we seem to have a different approach to, you know, the Ethiopian, you could say, um, testimony, the Bible, the Queen of Sheba, the Kevin and the Guest. But I love the brother's perspective. We've been reasoning after the Rasta Roundtable, even before this, to bring out more of the astro um, theological perspective. And I know that Brother Priest, Honorable Priest Isaac, that he as well has this on his platform you know what i mean so this is a really interesting area you know of connecting the dots where he says that the king's list you know the king's list provided by his imperial highness rastafari mcconan you know to i think it was cf ray that was published the king's list that many people have seen and there's various opinions and some debates and you know, people have their what they have to say about it, but some must defend it, you know, defend these things. And my brother Ross Safer Selassie, he brings forward uh astro theological approach to it, right, which is very relevant as well. We like to look at the textual analysis, we like to look at the linguistics, you know, the African Shemitic languages like the royal Amharic, the king of kings language the Ge'ez, right but also the biblical hebrew right so when this question about judaism does not appear anywhere in the bible the old testament and not even in new testament this this idea of judaism our response first of all was that it was a european a latter-day european thing right mainly to the european jews you know who, according to their own research, anybody look up, you know, Jews on the Jewish encyclopedia. Many people have looked it up. There's some stills out there that show that they even admit that their people, the European, the popular Jewish people today, you know, when you look at the Jews, the European Jews, state of Israel, Jews, you know, Holocaust, you know, you know, Germany, Nazi Germany, that their origins, the Khazarians, Ashkenazi related, Eastern European is 740 AD, Shlomo Sands, the invention of the Jewish people, right? Now, let's put this in perspective. When we talk about the Jewish people, when they are talking about the Jewish people, they're talking about themselves. Basically, they're talking about themselves. They're trying to, you know, relate themselves to this ancient heritage, that those of us defend this ancient heritage from the perspective of the tribe of Judah, let me say it again, from the perspective of the tribe of Judah, right, encompassing the tribes of Israel. So the origin of Judaism, what we did not go into on the Rasta Roundtable, we would do this here, but we did do this with the word myth and mythos, 
You know, it's good to see that some of the brothers, you know, embrace that truth right there that the word myth had a different meaning. It links in its ancient most meaning with oral traditions. And we know that, you know, African and Afro-Shemitic peoples, like the peoples of the Bible, right? Not just the Israelites, but also the ancient um, Kemetic and ancient Egyptian people that, and other peoples, but these peoples from the biblical tradition, right? Or in the biblical tradition, that they had what we call oral history, right? Like even in our families, you know, in the many of our families, how many times have we heard stories and narratives about our ancestors and relatives and relations? But then you know what happens? We keep passing it on and they've been passed on for a long time because many of our ancestors were not literate, could read or write. But one thing was honored and that was keeping the story consistent because they didn't have TVs or radio People would gather together around the bonfire or the fireplace or when family got together, you know, on various occasions, even for a Sunday sup together to gather that they would narrate and tell ancient stories. And if you was ever around some of the older folks from the older and previous generations, if somebody got a certain point wrong, somebody else would say, well, that, no, 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 no. They'll correct certain things. You follow what I'm saying? in order to keep things correct. So people talk about the telephone game. The telephone game is something that is because of these times of the Gentiles and this white Western Gentile world, how we've been... Pro that's part of the trick on them. That's part of the trick they pull out you know, because there was a time when there was not no heap of written text, like you say. You know, they say basically written text started to really be pervasive in the art around 5,000 years ago or so, something so they say. Now, these oral traditions that we've had as African people for a very long time, is traditions that we sit around the elders and is a community type, a village type of stories being told. It's not just being told to your family, it's being told to the community, to the village. So the younger ones is growing up, hearing these folk tales and these stories that now they're trying to call myth because they have taken our stories, repackaged them in their narrative and give it back to us. And now we're rejecting our own thing because we picking sense out of nonsense. Mm. So now when a man gonna come now and tell you that if you can't bring something in writing, hmm. that's, like you walk in for the same set of enemy them then with like like like, like whether you want to say you walk in for them or not, you basically on their team because this is what they do. They tell they take our stories that was handed down from generation to generation, and these things is true things that happen within life, within people's family and villages and communities and things that is passed down. And they take these things and make these things in what we call myth right now. So when a man here myth right now, the first thing he thinks is not true. He thinks some kind of fantasy sci-fi thing. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Did you and then they take mm. these things now and repackage our thing now with a different narrative. And now man is using the repackaged information to try to disprove our heritage and culture. Mm. From, from ancient seat. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Me falling for that, my lord. Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. want to fall for it, go fall for it, but me falling for that. Now we rise. And because it's written, there's a lot of things written that is fabricated nonsense. Like me and you reasoning one time and I show you the book I talking about, like you say, you see the same book, I think. Mm -hmm. Where the man said the emperor was illiterate, couldn't read nor write. Yeah. And then you say you turn around and see the man with a book and a pen. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he was reading something, one picture, and next picture he was writing something. Okay. You know, but it was written that he was illiterate. It was written in a book that was published. Mm. Exactly. That's in a book a man down the street hanging out that he wrote. This thing published. Exactly. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. And also, 
do you know, like back in America and the enslavement times of the Hebrews and Israelites in America, and there were many, there's a story about a black woman who was like either a nanny or, or someone who worked in like Massa's house, but she was such a good cook, right? That the, the, the so-called white woman or the lady of the house, right, on the plantation, she observed that. So she wrote down all the woman's recipes. So for years, the woman, the white woman was getting credit, <laughs> for the recipes, that she's the one that developed all these sort of recipes. But actually what it was with the woman, the black woman, she was the one that was actually doing the cooking, but the white woman would observe her and take notes and ask her questions. And she would write it down. And when she published it, she basically published it as though it was her own recipes. But ones and ones doing the scholarship and the research were able to find out. So in the same sense, I'm just showing in that example where there was ones that was doing things and even recipes, many recipes we have in our families back in the country or the Caribbean or down south or other places, more indigenous, you know, more, you know, back to the earth and the farm. There's these recipes that have been passed down. But guess what? Many of them wasn't written down. Have you noticed that? It's we nowadays who seem to need writing to remember while the ancients seem to have had a better memory and relied more on the oral transmission of history. That's what we have in the biblical narrative, right? Coming into writing was many oral traditions. Like, you know, Africans and Asians are very oral people in the sense of communicating these particular traditions to writing. Now, much of this often was classified as myth because, like we mentioned before, myth did not have this negative connotation, right? But in 1840, among the Europeans, because the Europeans didn't really have the myths of the quality of so-called, I'm using their terminologies, Afro-Asians or Africans and Asians. I put African first. Why am I putting African first? Because they say that the Hebrew language, the language of the scripture and the Bible, right? As well as Aramaic, right? But is Afro-Shemitic languages. You understand what I'm saying? Afro-Shemitic is another way. When we say Euro, that's short for European. When we say Afro, <laughs> that's short for African. I just want to point this out, not your hairstyle. But look at that. Afro can be a hairstyle too, right? But notice in the heydays of Ethiopia, notice how most of the people were wearing Afros. And over here, we was wearing Afros because there, the clarity of the transmission of who we were were not doubted as it is today among a many Latter-day Rastas. I got to say Latter-day Rastas because the elders will be horrified. I just say even mortified, but fire burn a mort, mortician death. But they will be like, you know, horrified at what's going on today among the youths. And it's because certain teachings, certain precepts have not been communicated. Or as you said about one of our brothers, it's in a humble way. Yeah, but on some things we got to burn a fire. They said open rebuke is better than secret love. So in this vlog right here, because we were already at the 13 minute mark, want to make this like a shorter video just to the theme right here. So brothers and sisters, hopefully ones are still, you know, viewing this or have come back to view it in pieces or little by little bite sized portion. We want to get to the very root of this idea right here on the screen. I have this. I, I took a couple of slides, quick slides on Judaism and the etymology of Judaism and the origins. And they say the origin of the Hebrews and Judaism. I'm just going to point out these three bullet points right here. Because of all the slides I saw, I said, these are some good samples here. It has two symbols. It has a star, what they call the Star David, and the menorah. Here's what I want to say, and I'll prove it later on, y'all willing. The Star of David equals the menorah. The menorah equals the Star of David. I know it's probably hard to see right now, but just write this down. Say, well, this is what Ross, this is what y'all didn't say. You know what I mean? Now prove it. We're going to prove the origin of Judaism in this video. We're using slides of other ones to give some comment and critique to it. The first bullet point says the civilization of the Hebrews. I like this one here because they go back to the Hebrews, right? To this Hebrew sense. 
there's a misunderstanding that's popular of what Hebrews mean. What some people say Hebrews go back to one name Eber because they can see a etymological relationship between the two words, right? From an English and King James version of the Bible. But that's not the real root of Hebrew. Hebrew is like when we talk about transcendental, you know, people talk about transcendental meditation, so to speak, right? Or a transcendental, one may say that, that God, for some belief, is transcendental. Like, in other words, he is both, you know, within and without. You know, but the idea of the word transcendental or crossing over, we hear about crossing over, right? We hear about one from beyond. That's the sense of Hebrews. Hebrew refers to the spirituality, right, of this people that descend from Abram Ha'ibri, from Abraham the Hebrew. This is why about 19 times in the Bible, Right, about 19 times in the Bible do we have this people referred to as the Hebrews. When they was in Egypt, this is how they were referred to, and it was called the God or the Elohim, Elohei Ha Ibrim, the Elohim of the Hebrews, the God of the Hebrews, an Egyptian term, the nature of the Hebrews. Right? The nature of the Hebrews. The difference between us and them was that our God, our power, is the power of powers, is the nature of natures. To other groups and their beliefs, even in Egypt or Kemet, they basically believe that, say, the god of the of the wind is a different god than the god of the rain, and the god of the fire is a different god than the god of the water, right? In the Hebrew conception, we cross over from that belief through our patriarch Abrams and others. I want to say others also believe the same thing. Even some Canaanites did. Like, I, I could bring this out in the Bible. And, um, brother, you got your Bible on you? Yeah, very great. Let me grab it. Okay, okay. Um, I just want to just segue to this point right here because in that slide, it's talking about the Hebrews and Judaism. So in order to explain correctly the origin of Judaism, right, it's important to link with the Hebrews. That's why this meme... That particular slide we just showed you is very important because the first thing that it does right here in this particular slide, right, is say that the civilization of the Hebrews, right, that Hebrew, being a Hebrew, is a spiritual terminology. I know many ones think it's being a Shemite and all this nonsense. A lot of that Shemite kind of thing, you know, is, is nonsense. What we have in the Kebrenegess and an early, um, among the early Yehudi, Judahites or Jews, and we're speaking about we the black Jews, you know, is a whole different idea than what the Europeans have brought forward in the popular Judaism. Now, as a Rasta, we just bun up the ism, right? But it seems as though we don't bun up isms anymore. That's what my, was my point. Like Judaism, when this ism is on it, we know that it's like they say Rastafarianism, right? Anyone who is is mature as a Rastafari know that that's like a that's a sneak disc or overt disc. That's an overt disc. Not saying that some people maybe can only understand those terminologies, and we might have to understand that they they use this to try to refer to what it is that we say we be. But we, can, we shouldn't get too comfortable with it, right? I would say the only ism, not the only ism, but one ism I more embrace is Ethiopianism. And that's still a Western Gentile term for something known as Ethiopiawinet, right? Ethiopiawinet. But you see what happens? Things get translated into English and they are the translators thereof. If you have the Bible, go to go to right here, just on the Hebrew point. So the Hebrew is the spirituality. The Hebrew refers to the spirituality, right? And being of Shem, right, is being of the one name Shem from, from the Bible narrative. But moreover, Shem is the name. Shem in Hebrew means being of the name. It's like we as Rastafari, Many of us faithfully have a honor for one who says, 
they are Rastafari, non-partial. It's Hashem. It's Hashem. Now the Hashem, the Hashem is the name, the, the name, and that refu that refers to Yahuwah, or as we would say in the English transliteration, and tra Jehovah. When we say Jehovah, those who are of he who be who he be, the Almighty, who is the power of powers. He is the Elohim. In other words, he is the nature of natures. And see, that was such a significant difference. That's why the Hebrews were persecuted on the religious level, even though ancient Egypt tolerated a lot of different interpretations. Our interpretation was not tolerated because it threatened the whole, you could say, re religious, spiritual idea. If one man is saying, I worship the God of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then I say, well, my power, my nature is the nature of those natures, is the God of those gods. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> that is, and that affects, you have to recognize that Egypt also was a very, I don't want to use the term religious, but I'm using these terms so we get out of this kind of spookism about ancient Kemet. Right, just like we have Christianity today, they all are not one denomination, but yet for a, for a non-Christian, it almost seems the same. Right, what you find is that different denominations believe something different. In Genesis fourteen and thirteen, the verse right here, Genesis fourteen and thirteen, it says, "And there came one that had escaped, and told Abram the Hebrew, or in, the, or in Hebrew, Abram ha Ibri." Ha Ibri, right? The Ibri, right? The one who has, let me show ones on the screen right here, the H5680. Ibri. Now, some like, um, what's his name? Dr. Reggie. He liked to say that it's Greek and all of this and some crazy stuff, right? And begins with an I. Well, here in the Hebrew, it says Ha Ibri. Ha means the, like Shem means name, and Ha Shem refers to Yahuwah or the Tetragrammaton. Right here, the BDB says Hebrew is defined as one from beyond, one from beyond. This was a designation of the patriarchs, the Trinity. Who's the Trinity of patriarchs? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why he says he is the God or the power of the Trinity. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is their designation, and also the Israelites, when they were still in their embryonic state in Egypt before the Red Sea, that's the birth of the nation, that's what they were called. And then after that, it's only others that really call us Hebrews, like the Philistines. They call us Hebrews. Why did they call us Hebrews, right, so much? Other nations, because of the spirituality. It's like, why do they hate on Rastafari so much? Right? It's because of the spirituality. How can you say right, that this one is the God-man, the king of kings, Christ in his kingly character? When we get to the root of Hebrew, it comes from Eber, and Eber is, was a son, right? one of the descendants of Shem. This is where a lot of people say Hebrew comes from. But when we put it into its context, right, it means the region beyond, I'm going down to Abar, there we go, Abar, A-B-A-R. And here's what it means. To pass over, by, to pass by, to pass through, to alienate. It can mean to bring, to carry, to do away, to take, to take away. There's a context of it that can mean to transgress. In other words, a transgressor, right, can be one who goes beyond. You know what I mean? Goes beyond. Like, like, like this is my bedroom, but you're up in my bedroom. You know, you have transgressed, you have passed over the threshold. But the basic meaning of Hebrew in relation to Abraham is that Abraham went from the more unrefined level of spirituality after the fall to a more refined level. Remember, his father was into making idols for people and those different stories and narratives about how Abraham had crossed over from that belief to a higher belief, you know, a, a higher way. In other words, he basically crossed over. He transitioned, right? And because he transitioned from the old ways of his people, that caused him to be alienated. And because he was not of the belief of the people, 
right, into God's, into the power being, being fragmented, into, into God being fragmented into little mini gods as it was. He was a transgressor to the people who did not believe as him. That's why when he's going through these places, even when he said that his wife is his sister, right, we know that in ancient times, right, <laughs> The, the type of woman one had also was a part of higher level of royalty and spirituality. If you notice in the other cultures, they actually married, even the Egyptian, sometimes their sister to maintain that authority to rule. So it's kind of interesting that Abraham, coming from a different tradition, but these traditions have a commonality. You know what I'm saying? It's how ones choose to live their life. So Abraham is called the Hebrew here. He is one who had crossed over for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. Now notice the Amorites later on become enemies that the Israelites are commanded to drive out. But in the early days, Abraham could chill with certain of the Canaanites, like the Amorite here, the brother of Eshko, the brother of Anir. And notice what it says, they were confederate Right? The word confederate is Baal. Baal. I know one's going to go wild over this. Baal is an idol. Blah, 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 blah. See, you're taking one slither, one slice, but you're not eating the whole thing. It's, it's like taking one slice and thinking that the one slice is all. Baal is a name of other nations' God, like the, like the Philistines. But you know what Baal means? It means the owner. It means the husband. It can also mean to be a citizen or inhabitant. R rulers were called Baal because they were like the husband of the city. You know, like whoever ruled over a city, he was like the husband of the city. Just as a husband would take care of his family, his wife, this one took care of the whole city as his family, his wife in that sense. But there were other people who actually took this particular common word sound and this common word sound was used as a designation for their God. So the word Baal is a word that means master or husband in the sense of owner. And yes, they were Baalit. They were Baalit. They were female owners. Here's what I mean. You have a master of the house, right? Somebody's called the master of the house. His wife, what would his wife be? The mistress of the house. The, the mistress, the mistress. Notice his wife probably, because if you look up the etymology of mistress, mistress means lady master. The mistress. But notice in the Babylon is confusion. And among the latter day Babylonians, the mistress is the other woman. What? See, that's their system. So we're using the same word, but in their system, the mistress is the other woman. In our system, the mistress is the lady or the wife of the master. So as Abram was the master of his house, Sarah was the mistress. That's why when, when Hagar ran away after she thought she was going to be the, um, the, 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 the woman that to bear that seed, the seed of the woman. She thought she was going to be that woman that's going to bring the Messiah or the God, the one that's going to save humanity, like the Christ and everything. So when she got out of line, Sarah, no doubt, was a, maybe a little bit harsh with her because what Hagar was playing was playing like, well, I got the baby, so now you serve me. And Sarah wasn't having that. So, yes, Sarah was a little harsh on her. She runs away, according to the Bible, and she meets the angel of Jehovah. And the angel of Jehovah asks her, Why, what's going on? What's wrong? And why have you fled? And what did the angel tell her? Submit yourself under the hand of your mistress. Because you are not the mistress. You're the other woman who has been brought up by the mistress. Right? That's why later on, Ishmael was caught mocking, right, his brother. Because, you know, sometimes people talk about toxic, toxic masculinity, but there could be also a toxic femininity. There could be toxic matriarchy, right? Come on now. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> amen. Does the church say amen? And this is not saying all. 
Listen, I don't want to blow your bubble up too much right here, but I think I really need to right here because, you know, people like to quote this verse right here where it says, my, you know, my people, right, are what? Destroyed. Is that that verse right there? My people are, are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's Hosea 4 and 6. Can somebody read the verse before it? The verse before it is Hosea chapter 4, verse 5. It says, therefore thou shalt fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Wow. Because then the, the next thing it says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, some people say that a woman can't teach, right? And they misunderstand what Paul is saying. The fact of the matter is that the mother is the first teacher. Yes. That's why the prophecy on Ishmael was that he will be a wild ass of a man because his mama was acting up. But notice, she was Egyptian. And then look at it. She was about to have a child, right? And now notice in ancient Egypt how strong, like, in, like many other cultures, it was that mother-son. There's this mother-son prophecy. There's this mother-son aspect. I know I'm going a little bit off on the reservation right here because this is all about the Hebrew. But I wanted to point out for the sake of the meme right here that reason why we're showing this at an intro right here because they say something very important, the civilization of the Hebrews because they stopped being a civilization when they went away from being Hebrews. In other words, when they went away from that spirituality of their patriarch, Abraham. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, they broke that covenant, you could say, of Abraham. And that civilization lasted about 1800 years, from 1800, like BCE, from the Abraham time to roughly 70 AD CE, almost 1900 years, right? A little short of 2000 years. Now, secondarily, it says the Hebrews were the founders of the religion of Judaism. Now, here's where it gets into the muck and mire. Right? In a modern sense of the modern world, this appears to be true. You see what I'm saying? But what's not really correctly understood is what is meant by religion. If you're talking about the Latin meaning of religion, we'll say no. If you're talking about the Hebrew sense of what the word religion would mean, that knowledge of the Yehudis, see, instead of saying the founders of the religion of Judaism, that is what the European Jews say. But when we go to what the Hebrew word for religion, the closest words, right, in the Hebrew, right, for religion, that will be the knowledge, right, or the law of the Yehudi. And the Yehudi is a tribe of people, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. It didn't say of the tribe of Judaism. They eventually, these Hebrews who identified with, with the knowledge and the law of the Yehudis, they became known in the English sense as Jews, but in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, we say Yehudi. So Yehudi was translated into the English as Jews. That's what we find it in the Bible in the ways we do, right? As Jews with a J and all, right? from the name of the Hebrew tribe of Yehuda, because Yehuda was the last of the Jedi. The Jedi, you know, like the Jedi. Jedi has a lot to do with Judah and also to know, Yada'a, Yada'a. They were the last of the ones that held, right, to that faith of Abraham, right? That's why Yeshua said to the Samaritan woman, y'all worship what you know not. We know what we worship for salvations of the Yehudi, Yehudim of the Judahites. He's saying of the tribe of Judah that are faithful to the spirituality of the patriarch. But now, Judaism comes from this right here. I'm going to the first meme that I sent the eye, the one from the Google search, Judaism etymology. The term Judaism derives from Iudaismus, Iudaismus, right? Or Eudaismus. Some will say Iudaismus, but in the ancient Latin, that'll be Eudaismus, Eudaismus, Yuda, you know, Yuda, Judah, Yehuda, Yehuda, Eudaismus, right? A Latinized form, 
Get this. Get what's being said here. A Latinized, that means Roman, a Latinized form of the ancient Greek, Iudaismos. Iudaismos. See, in the Latin, they did have a Y sound. In the Greek, because of how they spoke, the Hellenistic Greek, they had an I sound. So you say, Iudaismos. So what happened was that the Latin, the Romans, learned everything from the Greeks. The Romans took everything from the Greeks except law, right? Except law. The only thing that the Romans did not copy slavishly, the Greeks, was law. That's why under Roman system, they had republic. Under Greek system, they had democracy. You always... Now, in this yeah. Babylon system, it's actually a Greco-Roman system because that is the feet of the beast. That's what we have in Daniel's prophecy. You know, where we have this, this Greco-Roman system, right? So everything under white supremacy always goes back to either the Greeks or the Latin. Notice that. The European, they give the Greek and the Latin a high rating. You know what I mean? The verb ayudaizen, let me look at the Greek, ayudaizen, yeah, ayudaizen, it says to side with or imitate the Judeans. You see that there where it says Judeans? Yeah. See how they slick with it? Sometimes they'll say Jews, right? <laughs> Other times they'll say Judeans. Yehudim is how we would say it, right, in the Hebrew. Yehudim, right? But then when it gets translated through the Greeks and the Latins coming down to the English and the other European languages, that's why they say Jews. So basically, it's a matter of perspective. Jews is what we know in English based on education and translation. But when we get to our own root, it is Yehuda, not Yahuda. I got to point that out again because Yahuda, right, is not even proper Hebrew. Right. I, and I know ones are going to balk against this. That has to be another vlog right there. But it's Yehuda. Because Yehuda means praise. Yahuda, right, would almost say that Jah is praising. Tell me, who does Jah praise? <laughs> no, 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 for real. And, and this might sound weird, but Yah basically praises himself and those who do as himself, as, as, as he tells them to do, you know, but he doesn't really praise in that sense. See, the reason why Judah was called Judah, read it over again in the Old Testament. Judah was called Judah because his mother Leah prayed to Yahuwah for another son because she wanted to get closer to Jacob, Yahiko, right? And she says, now I shall praise Yahuwah. Therefore, she named her son Yehuda, praised, praised. In other words, she would praise Yahuwah, and she called that fruit, right, her birth in her fourth son, Yehuda. You know, that's why when you see the blessing of Judah, it says, Judah, you are he whom your brethren shall praise, right? Basically what it's saying, if you read the Hebrew, is that your brethren shall worship you, shall view you very highly. And that's why everything comes down to Yehuda in the New Testament and in translation to Jew and Judah and the Lion of Judah, right? So it comes from Yehuda, right? Which means praise, celebrated, which is also the source of the Hebrew term that he returned for Judaism is, is Yahadut. But you know what? This is not a scriptural term. This is a term that has been constructed into Hebrew, but it's not a biblical Hebrew term. Are you know what I'm saying? In other words, it's a term that has been, you know, many of the European Jews, their language was Germanic, the German language. Right. And were other European languages. Right. And you know what they did? Many times they wrote their own German language in the Hebrew script. That's also Yiddish. That's what Yiddish is. 
is writing their German language with a couple of Hebrew words. Like we taking patois and adding um, some 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 Amharic words to it, but then we write it in the Amharic script in the in the Fidel. You know what I'm saying? So when people say that, oh, modern Hebrew is Yiddish, they don't know what they're talking about. Because when they look at the letters, they can't read. They don't want to understand what they're talking about. Because if you understand what you're talking about, you'll say, like, like, I remember I received some stuff back in the COVID time. They was mailing around these things that had, like, Chinese, Arabic, um, Hindu. And I looked on it. I remember I saw something. I said, oh, they got some Hebrew here. That's the first thing I said. But then I started to, 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 to read it and try to read it. I said, what? This is not Hebrew. And then I recognized, oh, man, this is Germanic. This is Yiddish. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, look at the second slide, the second one, Judaism. The one that's from Etim Online, the one that read at the top, Etim Online, where it says Judaism. This is going to the etymology. This means that based on the English language and English archives and records, we can find words going back when they first were published at the earliest recorded publishing or writing or using of certain words and terms and what these words and terms meant back in those times. Just to even see how the English language has changed over a couple of 50, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200 years, the English language is always morphing, right? Like a chameleon, it's always changing, you know? Circa 1400s, but going back to when this word first came into English, Judaism, attested in Anglo-Latin from mid-13th century. That means, attested means that they can find and show and back this up by actual evidence from documentation going back to the mid-13th century. That's roughly around the time of like 1200s the 1200s. And this is in Anglo, that means English Latin, because Latin was a language that was highly used in England and other places in Europe. It was like, like our goodness or biblical Hebrew. You know what I'm saying? It was like the go-to for the, for the roots, right? So the roots of the European and even white supremacy has a lot to do with the Greco-Roman. That is their roots right there. That's why they always, in their etymology, you'll see most of the words go back there in their roots. From Old French, um, Judaism, or Judaism, by right? Judaism, directly. Notice they say directly from late Latin. Remember we showed you that in the quick Google um, etymology? Latin, um, Judaismus, from the Greek, Iudaismos. So the Greeks will say Iudaismos, and the Latin says Eudaismus, tomato, tomato, from Iudaios. Now notice, Iudaios means a Yehudi, that they say right here as Jew. It means a Yehudi, right? So people are arguing over this silly conversation, because we see Jew in the translation. Okay, let's go to the Hebrew. How many, how many can, can keep up? So let's understand that that Jew there is really Yehudi, right? And this is the Europeans translation into the European, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant vernacular. And this goes back here to circa 1400s. That means that Judaism did not exist, <coughs> right? As this word sound, this ism, Judaism, did not exist. So originally it wasn't so much a, a, a ism, but what does it say? To imitate? Didn't it say to imitate? Right? It, what's that first one said right there? It said to imitate, right, the, what, 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 where does this go right here? It derives from, it says, from the verb, I you die, Zane, to side with, or you see in the, what you call them, imitate the Judahites, right? So Judaism basically means to imitate the Yehudi, to imitate the tribe of Judah. In other words, Converted peoples are imitating by the ethnic people of the scripture. They are not the people of the scripture, but study and learn to imitate them. And they side with the biblical scriptural narrative of the tribe of Judah. This is clearly the root and the origin of this word Judaism. 
Now there was a little bit more that goes into Jew, right? To the word Jew. And the word Jew first comes into English. Sorry, bro, I didn't, I didn't take a screenshot of that. I will, so you can see this for yourself. The first part is like at the top of the page. And the second part, as you scroll the page down, when you look up any word and you put etymology behind that, it's a very good way to kind of like, you know, just get a, a basic, uh, you know, from the scholarship, you know, based on the scholarship, the available scholarship of what, you know, what different words basically mean. I want to send this to my brother right here. Just give me a moment to take a screenshot on this phone right here. I'm going to sum this up right here, my brothers and sisters. I know sometimes we can go long, but there's a whole context. And because of the context, a lot of people, in spite of what they're learning and knowing, you know, they get confused because if you don't put it in its proper context, right, just basic facts, you can have fact over here and fact over there and fact over there, but how does it work together truly and duly? I, I just sent it to you right here, my brother, where you, so you can see Jew. Jew comes from the late 12th century. The late 12th century is like the 1100s. So that means, remember, the King James Bible is 1611. Right? The word Jew, as we know it today, from G-U, G-I-W-J-E-U, this word comes into English around the 1100s or the 12th century. Right? So when we are connecting with, with, with the first century, the time of Yeshua, or connecting with what people call the Old Testament, don't make us have to defend no, quote, Jew. Why do we use the term Rastafari Jews or the term black Jews because we are continuing to fight the battle of our ancestors, right? You know, those black Jews of Harlem and others, even the Shashamani land grant administrator, the first one, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. James Piper, you know, was a black Jew, right? And His Majesty acknowledged those black people who identified as being of the tribe of Judah and of the faith, right? Now, you can be of the religion by conversion, but you don't necessarily have to be of the tribe because even in the Torah, it says whether one is a homeborn or the stranger that sojourns with you, there shall be one law. So even in the Old Testament, it shows the principle that we have in the so-called, quote, Jew thing. Right, that one can be a Jew by conversion or by accepting, right, and sojourning and living like us, you become like us. But this doesn't mean that you are of our, our, you could say, bloodline. You know what I'm saying? So, what we know as a fact, right, what we know as a fact is that the European Jews, right, they did convert to this roughly 740. A D. Right? And then we know also as a fact, based on the etymology, the term Jew first came into popular use in the English and Western languages around the time of um, 1100, which is the 12th century. A Jew, ancient or modern, they say is one of the Jewish race or religion. I know this here is hard for ones, right? Because they say Jewish, and they say ish could mean you're imitating Judeans, the tribe of Judah. But then ish in Hebrew means man. So of the Judahites, those who are of the tribe of Judah, that race, that seed of people, or the religion. You see what I'm saying? You know, it's like Rastafari, right? The, the first proclaimers of Rastafari, I and I, ancestors and the first proclaimers, they stated that we are Rastafari, right? Why? Because we black people have a, a link, a bloodline link and connection, right? With those of the tribe of Judah, of Haile Selassie and of Ethiopia, right? That's why Rastafari in some sense from the beginning has a very strong black reference, but it's not limited to just being black if one is of our way as Rastafari. You know what I'm saying? We have accepted other peoples who are not necessarily black and may not have come in the trans-Ethiopian ocean slave trade. You know what I mean? If they believe or admit 
or acknowledge as we, we have accepted them. That's why we say deaf to black and white down presses. But from the root, Rastafari is a black thing. Can, can somebody deny that? It is of a particular people who will have a particular descendancy and would belong to a particular tribe like black people in the Caribbean and America. We all came over here on this trans-Ethiopian ocean slave trade thing. So even if we wasn't all family, we all started to experience and our ancestors experienced more or less the same thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that makes us family. You know what I mean? That makes us family right there. You know, we should already know that's obvious. My brother, I'm not going to go through the full of full here. I'm going to leave it on the screen for folks right here yeah. because I know it's getting, you know, a little bit up into the early hours. And, you know, I know maybe the mind and we, we already was kind of long in this right here. But this, um, what it means to be a Jew can probably be another reason. And we can break down and build up. But as you can see right there, it tells you that literally Judah means celebrated. It means praised, praised or celebrated, right? Praise slash celebrate. It means the same thing. It's to praise somebody to celebrate, you know? But yes, my brother, we can seal up. I'll let the eye get the seal up right here, you know what I mean? On just the origins, you know, of what is called today, you know, Judaism, according to the etymology of the word, you know? According to the roots, the roots. <laughs> it says stick to the roots. Stick to the roots. We're going to the roots yeah. of words, you know. <laughs> you know this, this, this schism and schism thing we're dealing with, taking up a, you know, a narrative that is used to basically hijack certain things that we have. We have to careful with these isms and schisms because people is using these things, and you know, instead of one rebuking it, they they. You know, they're taking part in the conversation without rebuking it. That is accepting it, you know. Mm. And, you know, like you said earlier, you know, I and I is not a Rastafarian. I is Rastafari. <laughs> That's what the elders taught me. The elders, the elders, I remember, uh -huh. and we said that they will burn us, fire, fire to fire. I, Rastafari and what? And who? That's what they would say. I remember that. <laughs> Rastafari and what? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, <laughs> Me and they that is a man's schism thing with them, you know. And who want to hark and that can hark and that, knowing that this is a, a later day sound that you couldn't find nowhere in antiquity. So, the Babylon word trick. Yeah, and this is what they do. Like I said earlier, they repackage our information, put themselves in a narrative, fix a little couple things, and now. The things that you might see and reject, make you reject the whole thing, not realizing that it's only a small part that they had that they could actually manipulate. Mm -hmm. yep. They didn't manipulate the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of truth out there that has not been told, you know. True, but true. tell you not even half the story been told. No, he <laughs> said half. Like he said half was told. No, he said not even half. True, true, true. <laughs> true. <laughs> true, not even so, half. Not even the yeah, half. Yeah, not even half. So it could have been five, ten percent that you get truth, and the rest is lie. You know, so like the 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 map you sent me all year. Before oh, it started, it started, it started. yeah. To put a map on the screen there, you know, that, that map there where you show old Jerusalem, uh -huh. Jerusalem and New Jerusalem within, you know, uh -huh. traveling distance of each other in, 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 in different dispensation and time, you know? Hold on, hold on so, for a moment, hold on for a moment. Why don't I just, 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 just speak on that for, for a brief moment before we seal up. I want to put that map, that map on the screen here. Give me one moment. Go, go through, go through, my brother. Yeah, because we take in a narrative of certain places and all in this time and dispensation that we do research and find out that some of these places that they tell us is here was not there in those times. You know, when David was in Jerusalem, 
Davidson for Salaman to get the anointed at the Gion. No. If you thinking that he sent for this man way up there in what they call the Middle East, which is North Africa, to come down to the Gion to get anointed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this Jerusalem had to be someplace else. It, it, it couldn't have been where they say it is. You know, so there's places that they change the name of. A lot of places. We have to remember that the continent had no borders. It wasn't section up like always section up. No. So when a man calling himself this and calling himself that. It wasn't section up like that. Mm. Yes, they, yes, they had places where the names and everything are like that, but it wasn't section up into bricks. Like, we, 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 we look at a modern map now. It looked like a puzzle. The because of how they carved this thing up in the Berlin Conference. Mm. So, when we look now and see older maps, people want to dispute these things. But how are you disputing all and accepting you? Mm. That don't make no sense to have. Mm-hmm. Anything new come from something old or no? Anything new come from something old. So how are you going to reject the old and accept the new? When the new was repackaged to you. These are the things we have to understand. And when people want to push this thing about Rastafarianism and Judaism and you just parroting what these people want you to parrot, whether you know it or not, uh, I might be doing it on purpose, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> you understand? Because each man have his own agenda or no? Everybody has an agenda whether they want to admit it or not. You know, when you was talking about the word Hebrew and talking about it's a spiritual thing, my question was this right here. Hmm. When someone is said to be called a Hebrew Israelite, uh-huh. is that only accurate if that person is serving the most high in spirit and truth as an Israelite? That you can be called a Hebrew Israelite. That is my question. Oh man, that's 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 okay. Right now, um, check it out. I, I got on the screen the color one. I remember I just took a snapshot of that, but when I brought it up over here, it wasn't so um, yeah, it wasn't so clear, clear. Let me see if I could bring it up. Yeah, it wasn't so clear, clear. Hebrew Israelite. That's not that's not terminology that I I, re- I reference, but we don't really identify I and I selves as that when we say Ethiopian Hebrews, this is linking to the black Jews of Harlem and the pro Haile Selassie, you know, black Jews of Harlem and their testimony back in the the roaring 20s. And then the book by We the Black Jews. So cause of Hebrew Israelites, this is something that has happened since 1970 AD. That's because of what occurred in 1970 AD this kind of, that's a latter day terminology. Um, on a certain level, it's not really, it's not really accurate. It's not accurate. You know, there's no Hebrew Israelite in the Bible. It's like you hear people talk about Shemite and Hamite and Hamite and Japhetite. These are terminology you don't find in the Bible either. Notice that, you know, you find Hebrews, yes, and you find Israelites, yes, and you find Israelites called Hebrews, yes, and you find Israelites identify themselves as Hebrews, but it's the context of what they're, of, of what they're saying that's important. You know what I'm saying? It, it's interesting that, like I'll point out, if we look at all the places where Hebrew or Hebrews is mentioned in the Bible, we have the Exodus. It's when they talk about the God of the Hebrews. Right, the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Hebrews, and the Hebrews, the God of the Hebrews. Right, and then it speaks later on when they come out about the God of the Israel. Why do you think the mixed multitude, the mixed multitude, were like those who were like kind of converts for a moment? 
But when they went out there in the wilderness, they started to like, you know, itch and moan and everything. You know, they were the people who were in the same, you could say, cultural, spiritual and so-called religious orientation. So Hebrew Israelites, I would not co-sign that. Actually, when I say Hebrew Israelites, I'll be like, yeah, those who are called Hebrew Israelites. So ones can identify these are they who say that Hebrew Israelites today. It's just unfortunate that there hasn't been good teaching on what Hebrew really is. And part of the reason for that is that most are still just on a kind of a very surface level of the Hebrew. You know what I mean? And they haven't really gotten past the European Jews. Because in a sense, they kind of fail to learn certain things. Even modern Hebrew, learning modern Hebrew is necessary. We all know English, right? Do we say English is our language? But the better we know English is the better we can be able to discern the truth from the lies. You know what I'm saying? And then as we learn our own languages, we can then articulate it like that. So Hebrew Israelite is not a biblical terminology. Notice that it's called the epistle to the Hebrews and not to the Israelites. Anybody ever wonder why? Why does it call it the epistle to the Hebrews and it's not the epistle to the Israelites? Show me the areas where Hebrew is mentioned in the scripture and then we can really understand why and when they were referred to as Hebrews. In Egypt, referred to as Hebrews. And by other peoples, referred to as Hebrews. But they referred to themselves when they became a nation because before they were mainly a spirituality coming from Abra Abraham or Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, coming from those patriarchs. That was their spirituality. So when the Israelites were in Egypt, they was a family. They were a family. They became a nation when they came out. That's where the law and all of that was given to them. Now they're becoming a nation, the youngest nation, you could say, in the earth. The youngest nation, the new nation. You know, when, when we say as Rastafari, we, should say, we used to say as Rastafari, John call upon the youth, right? Yeah. Because they are strong, right? They call upon the youth. So after he had all these other nations that had done good or bad or whatever, he then chose another group of people based on on the spirituality of the patriarch. And he rated the Israelites, whether he blessed them or punished them according to their faithfulness to that particular spirituality and the covenant. The covenant basically describes that spirituality of the patriarch. It, you know, you can find in areas of the scripture where John says, I, I don't destroy y'all Israelites. He don't destroy us, not because of anything we do, but because he made a promise to the patriarchs. So John says, listen, if it wasn't for the fact that I promised Abraham and Abraham was my friend, you know what I mean? I checked for Abraham. <laughs> and notice how his majesty uses that, says that as Sarah was to Abraham, so was Empress Menon to him. He's giving us a powerful hint right there. So he checked for Abraham and he said that he would fulfill his word to Abraham. And then later on, when he made the covenant with David, he made it with David because David was faithful to that Hebrew principle, right? So even when David was in foreign lands, he still was doing the work of Yahuwah. Have you noticed that? He was, behind, he was with the same people of Goliath. He was with Goliath's family's people when he was running from the Israelite Saul. You know what I mean? Do you think he changed his, his religion or he did things a little different to accommodate them? Nah. You know, so he was faithful whether he was home or abroad. You see what I'm saying? He did not transgress or go back. You know, yeah, he made sin. Yeah, he, those were, we could say human, you know, man and fallen man sort of errors right there. But here was the Hebrew in him. That once, once Nathan the prophet checked him on that adultery, what did he do? He repented. He repented. He didn't make no argument. Well, it wasn't me. You know, she was, she was, because she was, she seduced me. Because I saw her naked. And if, if she wasn't naked, I would not have done that. He did not do an Adam. You know, the woman who you gave to be, no, nah, no, nah, he, he was like, 
you know, that's what Psalm 51 is from. You see what I'm saying? You know, he's the one who composed the Psalms. And he's the one, David was the one that, it's because of David in large part that we have the new covenant. Because David was a man after the Lord's own heart. As a man, he did some great things, but he did some bad things. But in his inner, his Hebrew, in that, that Hebrew part of him, he already had crossed over from low degrees to high degrees. You know what I mean? It's just that he was wrestling with his flesh. Like a lot of us as men, our carnal mind, our lower, you won't call your lower self or what have you. You know? And he becomes a template. You know what I mean? He becomes a template for the righteous. That's why the whole messiahship is wrapped up in David and Zion. You know what I mean? That's a whole related point right there. We don't reject Zion. But before the Zionism of the European Jews, we already had our Zion movement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you, you said it but well, my bro. You said that they take these things and then they repackage it to us. And we forget that these are our own things. Yep. You know what I mean? I don't want to reject it. It's like jazz. It's like jazz. It's like R and B. It's like rock and roll. It's like a lot of our inventions. When you tell people that a black man or a woman or a child invented these things, people are like, "No, that can't be." We have to go and and, and go to the um what they call it to the um Library of Congress. You know what I mean? We got to get all this data, and and even then, people still can't believe it. Why? Because that that Babylon, that's what it come out of her, my people. What's Babylon? What's what's the definition of Babylon? Confusion. And what well, didn't they say? Um, even all the wonders of Egypt, if we look at what um, black people has done in the Western Hemisphere in the last four to five hundred years, with what all they have invented to make this Western Hemisphere what it is today, as far as the superpower it is. It's because of what black people have invented. Ah, you say like I you think Egypt was great, look at what we did over here. Because in Egypt we was ruling when we did all those great things. True, true. Mm -hmm. Over here we was not we have not ruled yet in four or five hundred years. Mm hmm That's why we gotta rule the rhetoric. We gotta rule the rhetoric. Think about it. In Babylon, right? Or Babel, back in the beginning, right? As it was in the beginning, so it should be in the end. Notice, when Yahuwah came down, what did he do? According to the Bible, he confounded their language, right? And therefore, Babylon comes out in that sense of, of confusion, right? He confounded their language. What did Rastaman do, right? Well, we pick sense of nonsense. Where mine and mine, who wasn't even literate or had access to the sort of knowledge that many of us have access now of internet and this and that and the next thing, right? Were able to take the little bits and pieces of information that was available to them. And they was able to have high reasonings and the movement was progressive, was moving, you know what I mean? And you can tell that the movement was in Jah's way because Babylon was down on us. You know what I'm saying? As soon as Babylon relent, it's like men, they kind of repent of being Rastafari. You know what I'm sure. saying? As soon as things become a little bit easier, like locks get accepted by other people. That means then man is not defending Bible no more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, some other things, herb get accepted. People now doing organic or doing natural foods. And forget, like you talk about the invention, just think about the Rastafari movement over here in the West, right? Just looking at those three main things, organic food, focusing on healthy food, getting back to the earth, right? And respecting creation, you know, the wisdom of the almighty and creation, right? The herb for the healing, that herb could be used for sacrament, but also it had a lot of healing properties when they were saying that Babylon, Babylon was saying that Rastaman high. Rastaman talking about herbs can heal. We wasn't saying just marijuana. We were saying many herbs can heal. We've gone sing this long time ago, no? Earth cycle now, Rasta. Hmm. <laughs> you see, we was ahead oh, of the Earth curve. Cycle, no. Do Earth Rasta cycle. Rasta forever. Uh, aye. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we was ahead of the curve. You know what is that? The first shall be last. You know what I'm saying? 
and the last shall be first. Think about it for a moment. Listen. Rastafari was first on so many crucial things that Babylon has hijacked to the law. Think about it for a moment. The whole the marijuana industry. People think it's good because now they legalize it. Yo, that's the trick there. People right? think because it's a Lukai Sella, meaning good. Yo, there's a verse in the Bible. I should have licked it up on the Rasta round table. There's a verse in the Bible that says that and 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 how they um they work mischief through the law. You know? Yeah. Through, through the law they work mischief because once they control it, right, like that. You know what I'm saying? Of course people say, Well well Peter Tosh said legalize it. If they legalized it then when Peter Tosh said it, Rastafari would have a majority share in it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. If they had legalized it then, because the movement was more I can say was more centrist on the teaching of his majesty. The movement has gotten decentralized on the teaching of his majesty. Bruh, Psalm 94 and 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? We're speaking to his majesty here in the Psalm 94 and 20. Shall the throne, here we're saying the throne of iniquity, the throne of of, of desire, chasm, destruction, calamity, coveting. That's what the word iniquity means, mischievous, the hava, right? Show the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee who frames mischief by a law. They frame mischief by, by a but by not the law, but a law, right? Because what they do is they create their own laws, right? And therefore, the bad thing about the whole marijuana thing was that Rastafari, how can I say, we had no agenda for the sacramental, you know, as Rastafari. You know what I mean? As Rastafari, we joined bandwagon with, what was it? For recreational. I was surprised, man. My elders told me recreation. Check the word sound. Wreck <laughs> creation. Wreck wreck your creation. Wreck creation. You see, you know what I mean? Wreck cre I yo, you just remind me of something that I was listening to the Psalm, Psalm eleven, and the reasoning about the different cups and the chalice. And it was interesting because there are chalices that will be given to Babylon. The cups that will be given to Babylon to drink. You know, drinking the archaic another form of drinking is smoking. Right? I've actually found that in the Ethiopic, that in the archaic Ethiopic or Amharic, that they wouldn't say to smoke as we say today, but they say to drink. Right? So in a in a new covenant and looking at it today, a lot of what's going on in the cannabis is going to be a part of the judgment too. You see what I'm saying? Because if cannabis, if the herb is holy, right, and we study the Bible. We have to strive for holiness, don't we? We have to strive to maintain. You was asking me about that, the holy and sanctified. We was reasoning on that. We didn't do a record on that. But the basic point is we have to strive to maintain a set apartness and set apart for our namesake's use, for Rastafari use. We can't make Rastafari for me, she, he, and the old lady, you know? Sanctify yourself. Exactly. If we call his name, how can we go away from his way? That that's what it comes down to. That core, you know, that core denominator, you know. But the, but John did say there'll be days like these. Many are called, right? Many are called. We have to just check out what we have chosen. Have we chosen Rastafari according to Rastafari Kadamawi Hala Selassie, or have we chosen Rastafari according to? To some some other guy or some other I ideology, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you're sitting there waiting to be chosen again. <laughs> Many are cold, few are frozen. That's what I say to that right there. You know what I mean? Um, uh, but choose, like, like it says, choose you this day, right? You know whom you shall serve. But yeah, I showed the map here, and I'll I'll send the I forward. Um, there's a PDF of this, but. Um, the hard copy of this particular book is the 
is the Sheba narrative. What ones are seeing on the screen here is the book by the late um, Dr. Bernard Lehman, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. And this is a, 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 a European, a white man who, who wrote a very good book because why his book is good is because he critiques academic other scholars that have sought to minimalize or marginalize right, the Eastern and Ethiopian right, and black, you could say African interpretation of things. You, you see at the bottom of the thing, the bottom of that same picture you said to share with the audience, it says yeah. the shaded area in the region that contains the quote Hebrewisms. I, I like how he quotes that because there's something called the Hebrewisms of West Africa. There's a book that has been published some years ago. Now, I know this has isms there too, but try to get past that, what they call the Hebrewisms. And remember, the ism has a sense of, of imitating or resembling, in that sense. Recorded yeah. by Hayim Rabim in Ancient West Arabian. Ancient West Arabian is right across the Eritrean Sea or the Red Sea, right across the Red Sea from Ethiopia. It, like we show you in the map right there, where you see, you see where Ethiopia is, you see where Aksum is, right? You see what, what, where it's said that old Jerusalem is. Now those areas there today is Mecca. You know, the Muslims and, and, and all their religious thing, that is Mecca. That's the regions over there. Now think about this. Saudi Arabia only started to rule that region when the British allowed them to Get this, bruh. In the 20th century, I'm talking about the 1900s. You see how the British are not easy? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? You know, and that's, that's because of the oil, right? The Old Testament place names noted by Kamal Salibi. That's the one that Brother Icoma had pointed to and was reasoning on even before we came on the podcast, you know, Rasta Roundtable. Look, it says iron deposits and an ancient ark culture. What they're saying is that many of the peoples had a ark culture, a culture that involved arks, holy arks, right? You know, in modern Judaism, even among the Latter-day Jews, they still use a symbolic ark. That's where they keep the Torah scrolls and all the other scrolls, ideally on the western wall of their gathering place, the ark. But Ethiopia is known to have this culture, too, that connects with ancient Afro-African Shemitic culture of Judaism, or what we call Judeo, the Yehudi culture of the Old Testament, and the Nazarene, the true Messiah culture of the New. So they're saying in these places, in Arabia, there has already been found these things that points to more evidence, but they have not been excavated yet. Why? Because that would undermine the present geopolitical, yo, you talk about war? I'm talking about even maybe nukes coming out? This is where the nukes will really come out from. I'm, not, I'm being serious about this right here. This is some serious, if something were to reshift the focus if this knowledge were to be accepted, it will reshift the whole focus of the so-called pseudo-Middle East and will cause something that will be like, like the coming of the day of vengeance, right? It also shadows lucrative incense, gold and precious stones and luxury goods trade from Sabea or Sheba. Even in the Bible, it tells us that King Solomon and the Israelites of that time got their incense and other things that they use in the town. Even ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt speaks about the particular land of Sheba, as well as where Ethiopia is in Aksum, as being like the God land and the holy land, the Taneta land, the land of the gods. Because of the richness of the Aishans, the gold, the precious stones, Right? This area was temporarily abandoned by Egyptians and Assyrian control, imperial control around 1000 to 2 1000 to 920 BCE, the same years as the zenith, the height of the Israelite state 
under David and Solomon, King David and Solomon. That's the only time we get recorded in the Bible and in ancient history when Israel, the 10 tribes and Judah, the Southern kingdom, the kingdom of, we could say David was united as one. You see what I'm saying? And this is the same time as we get the Queen of Sheba, right? And so what it's saying here is that in these regions, we have all the telltale signs from that period of time that is recorded in the Bible. You see, and before the modern time, before the time, roughly around the time that his majesty comes in the world, this area, as the brother was mentioned, then was chopped up. It was chopped up into different states. That's what the Bible talks about, the times of the Gentiles. Gentiles means nations. The Bible prophesied there'd be days like these, when there'll be nation states. A nation state is a political structure, an artificial political structure that is created, the nation states. Because before you didn't have nation states like these, right, today. These nation states, all of them comes out from the Europeans, you know, and the British, Ruling three-fourths of the world, which is prophecy, right? The only place they was not able to rule that they wanted to was where? Ethiopia. You see what I'm saying? And Ethiopia had a secret. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> now that the secret gets out, that hidden empire becomes revealed. You know what I mean? They have to do things in order to try to keep what they got going on in check. And that means disinformation. His majesty tells us about that. The youths have to watch out for the disinfo. That's well, the important. everything you read. You, you know what I mean? You know, but everything you study, you know what I mean? You will get a better, you know, a better 411. Yeah, my brother, this was this was good right here. You know how we do when we just vibes and even though we might begin off on a certain, you know, topic or subject, sometimes it's necessary you know what I mean? To kind of link other world events. Or, within the reasoning. Yeah, in, in, into the full the full picture. You know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah, yeah. See the full picture. Get the full lay of the land. Yes, my brother. Um, Definitely pick up on this. So I'm just going to call this origin of Judaism. <laughs> <laughs> you know, origin of Judaism. Yes, I origin of Judaism. There's some more slides and everything, but you know, you know, we reason. Yes, my brother. Give thanks. Definitely. Give thanks. For guidance and protection. Yes, I. Guidance and protection, my brother. Wendemay. Yes, I. I am. Pastor Farai. 